Welcome back, Left Reckoners. I'm Matt Leck. With me, as always, David Griscom. Hello, David. How's it going? Uh, it's going well. And uh, joining us today to get into the history of the radical scientists and their fight against a lot of things, including uh, race science, uh, Kevin Bird at the Bird Maniac on Twitter. Give him a follow. He's a PhD candidate at Michigan State University, specializing in plant genome evolution, and he is, uh, uh, you know, an exponent of that radical scientist tradition. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm really excited to uh, get uh, have you on the show to get some clarity over. There's a new book coming out that's bringing a lot of uh, familiar arguments. Uh, that, you know, propped up back uh, in the Sam Harris, Charles Murray uh, is uh, the most unfairly maligned man of our generation time period in 2018. <laughs> um, but I want to start first with we, ha we have this this clip of Stephen Jay Gould sort of in the left reckoning canon. Uh, and it's him describing it's a, it's a couple minutes long, but it's a few different arguments. That I, th I think serve as really good heuristics for folks who don't have science backgrounds, but to understand the game that's being played with some of this stuff. And uh, and then you can give us the context for uh, Gould and the other scientists that were in his sort of milieu and what their sort of, uh, uh, you know, their legacy is to this day. Uh, here is this. What do you think uh, American society is so obsessed with IQ? I don't know that we're obsessed by it, but uh, I think it arises largely in the context of the lamentable history of our racism. I don't know that it's as much an issue in more homogeneous societies, but we have a situation based on the legacy of racism and continued oppression of people of African descent in this country that has led, for social reasons, to poor average performance of blacks on these tests. That doesn't tell you why it happens, but in a basically racist climate in a country with a strong racist history, I suppose it's not surprising that particularly conservative social thinkers would try to relate poor performance of blacks to intrinsic biological limits. The whole history and subject after subject of trying to encompass complex and, and independent attributes with a single number. Uh, my colleague uh, Medawar, for example, once wrote a very interesting article showing how in soil science, and it's a totally different field, People f for decades got hung up on trying to get a single number to measure the quality of soil. Now, how can you do that? There's no such thing as the quality of soil. This one is 51. This one is 76.2. There, there isn't. There are just different things that soils can do. The same. Now, the human mind is even more complex. There is no number that can capture the quality of mind, and it's almost humorous to think that there is. But unfortunately, the assumption that we can do such a thing tied to the use of such theories by conservative social ideologies has had profoundly negative consequences for the lives of millions of people. There are millions of people, particularly in this country, who've been told they can't do this, who've been denied admission to this or that program on the basis of a number, which was falsely interpreted as representing an intrinsic limit upon them based on their biology, but was in fact only a measure of social influences upon their lives. So unfortunately, it's not funny when it's had such tragic consequences. And that's, of course, why we are upset over the fact that the issue seems to keep coming up, because it has consequences. It hurts people. Who was Stephen Jay Gould, and why was he um, so hard on uh, race scientists uh, in particular? Yeah, so it's Stephen Gould was a Harvard evolutionary biologist um, probably one of the best science writers and popularizers of uh, the 20th century. And um, a really uh, ardent social critic, uh, paying it real close attention to the way that like science and society intersect, which is where a lot of his public outspokenness about race science, about genetics really comes into play. Um, and another thing about Gould is that he was, I believe, like a lifelong Marxist. He, he in one of his writings, talks about being uh, raised on his, on his like, father's knee reading Marx. Um, and he's part of uh, this kind of like broader group of, of scientists at the time, the 70s, 60s, um, called the Radical Science Movement. A bunch of, of socialist Marxist, kind of like left adjacent academics um, 
coalescing around the anti-war movement at the time, uh, nuclear disarmament, um, social, racial, uh, gender, class progress that was kind of happening at, at the time. And the opposition or, or the focal point on things like race and IQ uh, comes from sort of their broader uh, fight against what the called or, or what the identified as biological determinism, which is basically this idea that um, in our nature, in our genetics, something biological, innate, fixed, unchangeable, determines the structures of our societies, determines the hierarchies we see in the world around us. And, and at this time where there is all sort of like social change going on, there was this resurgence of biological determinism, um, specifically with this sort of race and IQ stuff of trying to justify racial inequality, trying to, to, mm -hmm. to undermine, you know, school integration, civil rights movement and things like that. Yeah, so Jim Crow basically just gets over, and we need to find some way to justify um, black people being behind. I guess is is that a, is that a, a too reductionist uh, view, or I mean, basically that's it. No, I mean a lot of, uh, and we'll probably talk about it later. But you look at um, a lot of the people who are writing these papers, arguing for race and IQ differences that are fixed and are unchanging, were actually funded by uh, this organization called the Pioneer Fund, founded in 1937 by like a, a Wycliffe Drafer, a, a textile magnate, who was a white supremacist. And this organization yeah. was, was focused around like race betterment and, and arguing for like segregation and eugenics. And the research that was being produced this time that Gould and others were responding to was directly funded by the Pioneer Fund explicitly often to like undermine school integration, undermine civil rights movements, people testifying in Congress to stop, you know, Brown v. Board. Um, so like, you're not far off when you say this research was was really concerted to undermine those social movements. Yeah, and it's really frustrating, you know, um, I, I didn't put this on the outline, but that E.O. Wilson um, um, issue where he's, he, he, he basically has the argument kind of like Sam Harris uh, has, which is like the problem is the people pointing out that this stuff is political. Like this, this is very, th this is motivated reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. This is uh, racially motivated reasoning, um, like, you know, because of the history of our country. And the problem is when people point out that, that those are the people that are being, you know, the problem. Uh, I guess just comment on that a little bit. Like, cause that, because yeah. to me, like this is that this, Seems a lot clear post Charles Murray. Like I, I, for some people it wasn't, but that seemed, But pre Charles Murray, like I'm curious about like that that discussion. That was, you know, there's a, a very long people on on Twitter and evolutionary biology are talking about this a lot since C.O. Wilson passed in December. There's been a long. Um, disagreement feud between people like E.O. Wilson and, and scientists like Stephen Gould and and um, Richard Lewinton. Um, you know, part of the radical scientist movement was also um, a different view of science, trying to recognize science like a social institution that's mm. colored by people's background, by our cultures, by our preconceptions. And recognizing that and, and identifying research that is largely motivated by ideology or, you know, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. Um, this is like Gould also sort of dabbled in history of science quite a bit. And this is kind of a constant thing that he talked about in The Mismeasure of Man. Um, he writes quite a bit about um, little vignettes of history of anthropology, craniometry, um, and, and the ways that racism sort of colored subconsciously the way people use these methods, the way they uh, understood or studied humans. Um, and so that's a big thing for for this group for people like gould is that science is a social activity it, it is affected by our institutions by our politics and you can't ignore that and then there's this camp of people like sam harris especially who want to think about science as this like objective thing mm. that's outside of humans outside of like the messy biased things that humans do and everything that they do uh, and so, like, I think a lot of the animosity, a lot of the, the um, 
feud comes from people not wanting to accept that or thinking that we can turn that part of our brain off and be robots doing science. Whereas Gould was often, we're all biased. We all have a background. We all have an ideology, a culture, a society. We should re like recognize that, grapple with it, and try to do the best that we can with full knowledge that we're you know, flawed people. Yeah, and I, I want to underline the mismeasure of man. I've recommended it before, but people really should uh, check it out. Um, but that that idea about biases, right? Like, as if something is biased, then oh, everything's done. We can't do anything. No, actually, that's part of science. Like, uh, like uh, recognizing those biases and factoring them in, so you totally understand them. I think it, it's it just seems childish to me. Um, and I, I we understand the motivation. I, and it's hard to say. Like, I think there are certain people who get into that science mode and it's hard to see like who's a crypto racist versus who's just like a science true believer mm -hmm. but like um it, it's as somebody who like i bought a richard dawkins uh, out atheist t-shirt uh in like 2006 like i can understand like certain people kind of getting into like why why do i have to think about you know tr like trans people in the history of american racism or stuff like that like I, I mean i don't think it's a good impulse but you know you can see where it comes from um in unfortunately and it's nurtured by folks uh so let's move now um so let's talk a little bit about um before we get to this new book mm -hmm. charles murray comes along and he's like basically i mean is it too much to say he's like a cons react cons propaganda <laughs> asset and more than a scientist um for like you know like we talk about the pioneer fund funding all that research this is this this is the same thing with charles murray he's a, a guy with a political project who again like sam harris wanted to uh wanted us to take seriously just as a disinterested scientist uh yeah you know um Charles Murray, I think when he wrote the bell curve was, was at the American Enterprise Institute. He really like makes no, no uh, effort to hide that he's, you know, a libertarian political scientist. Um, the whole point of the bell curve, like the whole thesis was that like class divisions are this reflection of, of, of biology, biological differences between the rich and the poor. And then he, throwing in that chapter on race, which, you know, extensively pulled from uh, pioneer fund authors. Um, so, you know, that was, I think there had been several beats up to that point of people publishing work, talking about like the heritability of intelligence, kind of taking this uh, kind of esoteric statistic from quantitative genetics and throwing it into this discourse where it's being used to argue that, you know, uh, intelligence can't change from environmental interventions and it's largely fixed to genetic. Um, in 1969, uh, the psychologist Arthur Jensen published this paper arguing basically that, you know, intelligence was largely innate, fixed. You couldn't uh, shrink the differences between the economic classes. You couldn't shrink the differences between races. Um, and that was sort of like the real uh, kicking off point for decades of, of debate, discourse, arguments between people like Gould and Lewinton uh, arguing against this stuff. And then in, uh, was in 94, the bell curve comes out and, and it's just sort of like this, like capstone to several decades of stuff and, and, you know, just really throwing hard into class divisions and, and their biological basis and race divisions, the biological basis. Um, and, and certainly is sort of like, I think a lot of people's touchstone when it comes to, uh, buying into those beliefs or coming into contact with those beliefs. Yeah. And go ahead, David. No, I, mean, I just wanted to, to note too, um, you know, that this is not unique either to, to science, right? Like throughout this whole period politically, um, you know, they're trying to, the right wing is like trying to find these social indicators to sort of argue that, you know, <laughs> um, poverty can't be dealt with one through so, social programs or by God, by redistribution of wealth, right? That is, you know, simple fixes like people have moved away from God and the family and the destruction of like family life because of the sexual revolution of like the 60s and 70s is like, you know, broken down that, that family unit that prevents poverty, right? Like all of these guys are swimming in waters trying to find something that they can sort of sell to the public uh, to convince them. Um, and obviously the, the IQ stuff is very, very uh, sinister because one, I think a lot of people 
don't really understand the science behind um, one, just like genetics in general. And then two, you know, IQ, a lot of people, um, I don't think realize how tenuous of a, of a measure that that actually um, is either. But it just is worthwhile noting that like this whole period of especially like the 80s and 90s is a lot of people, a lot of these big think tanks, like putting out funding to get people to like, they're looking for an answer. Um, so they're looking for the question for the answer that they already have, right? <laughs> yeah. And there's a really great book um, by Richard Lewinton and Leon Kamen and Stephen Rose called Not in Our Genes. Um, and the it, it covers a wide range of, of, of things, but it, the first three chapters are sort of like a historical and political analysis of biological determinism. And like the main thesis behind it is, is like this idea of... Uh, societies are a reflection of the biology of individuals and individuals are a reflection of their genes is largely like this expedient thing to support the status quo to undermine um you know civil rights movements and 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 progressive uh uh like movements um and i just lost lost my train of thought there um well that, that's that, let's talk about that a little bit because like this so, like they undermine uh, uh, progressive movements. Um, that brings us a little bit toward today and how this gets packaged, right? Which is we actually just want to help you, social justice folks. Um, and we're not like so. We have this new book. Uh, let me let me put up your review of it. I do want to compliment. Um, this is a from Massive Science. Um, I want to compliment the audio reading uh, system they have on Massive Science as somebody who's a big audio guy. Uh, <laughs> incredibly, uh, uh, the voice sounds amazing. Uh, the genetic like lottery is a genetic. bust for both genetics and policy. See, it's so it's so lifelike. <laughs> um, but yeah, folks should check out this. But yeah, how how does she, Catherine Page Harden, right down the road from uh, Griscom at uh, at Austin, uh, UT Austin? Where is she situated in this? And I guess, what does that mean for the argument? Um, and uh, because it is like, and I can't quite understand. That's the problem with this stuff is like, you sound like Charles Murray to me and you say you're not, but I don't quite mm -hmm. understand what, what I'm missing out on if I like decide you're not Charles Murray, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so Paige is, I think safely to say like not, uh, well, yeah, extremely safely, not in the scientific racism camp. Like she's written criticisms of Charles Murray, especially the race and IQ stuff before. Um, there's been sort of this eternal struggle with behavioral genetics because in in 1969, when when that kind of flashpoint came up, that relied on the techniques of behavioral genetics, things like twin studies and, and heritability. And behavioral geneticists had this conflict of how to deal with that where some of them usually people who worked on like animals and and did more like direct experimentation were like twins like there's a problem with the way that twin studies are being used this is uh you know a, a improper kind of like weaker science than what's being sold it's morally you know an abomination and there is another camp that just wanted to try to save the field of behavioral genetics that did twin studies did human behavioral genetics wanted to save their field. And so the, the separated themselves from the racists, but the basically accepted the methods, the interpretation, you know, a lot of these, like, you know, a lot of like general biological determinist rhetoric. And I think Paige is sort of a couple generations removed from that lineage of, okay, we're not going to try to argue that white people are genetically superior to black people, but we're going to use the latest genetic genomic technology to understand the genes that make people or that, that make people more uh, more intelligent or have higher education, mm -hmm. um, you know, really think about those things at this genetic and biological level, and and that's basically her her research program and a big thesis of the book. Sort of in the early chapters is we can't ignore the genetics of education. The genetics of education are just as important as environmental determinants people things like family income um this explains people's you know the wealth that they generate um and that's basically the thread through the entire book and then there's a chapter explicitly that's like hey you can't use this stuff to compare races 
don't do that. Like it's bad science, but we're going to do that to talk about the differences between like the economic classes. So I, I don't want to take us off track, but I, I, I would like if you could just briefly explain for people who aren't familiar uh, what twin studies are and like, you know, the, the kind of tension there, um, just because I, you know, obviously context clues, I think most people can figure it out, but there's a history there that I think is worthwhile for people to know. Yeah. Uh, so, so twin studies are basically um, a way to try to have the same sort of like experimental power that plant and animal breeders do. Mm. So like I'm a, I would do a lot, I've done plant breeding work in the past. You're able to, to fully randomize the different, the different lines that you're growing. You can grow them out and replicate. They're genetically identical. You can't do that in humans. So people used to do like family resemblance studies, correlate child to, to parents. Uh, but twins were like the, 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 the bag that they thought that they finally had something, which is, um, Identical twins theoretically share 100% of their DNA and the fraternal, fraternal twins share 50% of their DNA. And so the general design is you look at how similar identical twins are compared to how, how identical fraternal twins are. And based off of the difference in how similar they are, you can attribute that to genetic differences. That's, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a ton of, a ton of issues with it still based from the fact that humans aren't randomly distributed across the environments. Like there's, there's, we live in a, a heavily structured society where um, our environmental experiences are like heavily constrained by mm -hmm. things outside of our genetics. And these sort of interactions and correlations among genes and environments is something like twin studies do not do a good job of, of controlling for. Um, there are like a few other like very kind of in the weeds arguments, but like generally the idea is that like twin studies can tell you that there is, there's something genetic going on, which I think like sort of fundamental, like we're biological creatures. Uh, most of the things that we do are affected by our anatomy, our physiology, our brain, but it, you know, it's tried to be used for, this is more genetic than environment. This is 80% caused mm -hmm. by genetics. Um, and, it's kind of way beyond what these methods can, can say. Yeah, it, it's sort of, I mean, there's two parts of it, right? There's the, there's the race part and the IQ part, and both of them are fraught. And I guess so now they've sort of, I, like you say, jettisoned a little bit the race stuff, but it's still, kind of, yeah. I mean, I have this, uh, this section from a Christopher Hitchens uh, um, uh, review of the bell curve from 1994, which is, I always think of when I see IDW folks that, Hitchens has like been on panels with uh, spread bell curve stuff. Um, but it's, he says, in other words, scientific advance confirms that there is only one human race, that the individual possesses fantastic complexity and variety, but pseudoscience persists in its petty quest for the elusive G spot of quantifiable intelligence. And the rest of the latter practice is that individuals become subsumed into lumpish arbitrary categories and conservatives will take credit for the brilliance and, uh, and the conservatives want to take credit for the brilliance of the second option. Let them have the ice people and the sun people and all the rest of their rubbish while the left emancipates itself from all versions of ethnicity and concentrates on what it should never have forgotten what Gramsci called the project of the whole man. Um, uh, so yeah, I guess I, I sort of went down a, a Hitchens uh, sidebar there, but um, I, I, what else do I want to uh, cover here? There's a, there's a few directions I could go. Um, let's see, where'd my notes go? Um, oh, I also, I'll, I'll cut, I'll cut out that a little bit, but I do want to mention on twin studies, um, that there is, was that like that sort of seediness of twin studies coming out in the nineties a little bit, because I'm an X-Files fan. There's a lot of, there's like multiple storylines of like unethical twin study sort of conspiracy. And it's, you know, it's made for like an alien conspiracy, obviously. But like, is that, was that a bit, is that when the controversy was coming out about those? There's, there's been kind of recurrent controversies. So like, since it was the basis of these arguments about heredity, even back in like, I think the fifties, when it was done by like Cyril Burt, and there is even like fraudulent, like fake twins that were generated to make a study that was like the kill shot for the genetics of, of intelligence. Um, there's always been these criticisms 
um, from plant breeders, from evolutionary biologists, from quantitative geneticists, like kind of saying like, like slow your roll. You're like, you're reading way too far into this method. Um, you know, the nineties, I think behavioral genetics was just kind of like churning out twin studies. And so I think there's kind of this constant, um, ebb and flow of it being part of a national dialogue. And you go back and, and, you know, the resemblance of families was what, um, was what like Francis Galton used to try to like justify a lot of his eugenic stuff. And, you know, I think there's, there's quite a bit of, of, uh, records of, of Nazis using twins as sort of these like really twisted experiments. And, um, so like, there's a lot of stuff tied up with it just beyond this kind of like biological determinist race mm -hmm. science stuff. What do you make of, because uh, last time I, I shared the uh, Gould video, there's people that are saying uh, he's been debunked, actually. Uh, I, I looked into that a little bit into the sense I could ascertain. It seems like uh, it's the way Nancy McLean has been debunked by uh, uh, libertarians. Uh, it, in other words, no, uh, it's some, a lot of special pleading. But what's your assessment of the so-called debunking of Gould? Yeah, I mean, there's people have come at like every, every angle of this book. Like some of the most high profile ones was, was there's a chapter about um, Samuel Morton's skull collection. And so this guy who measured the, the capacity of skulls from people around the world and, and, and showed that there was greater like, you know, skull capacity in white people than, than people from Africa. Um, and cool. Did a really, did a really good job of, of going through and identifying places where the subtle bias that he was really interested in came in. So like Sam Morton had extensive documentation of everything that he did, definitely not trying to do conscious fraud and was like really praised as this big empiricist, this, this data driven guy. And Gould goes through and documents several cases where, um, you know, he included a subsample for uh, it, like indigenous people of, of North and South America that had average smaller skulls and excluded uh, people that were grouped under like the white race that had smaller skulls and just like a bunch of kind of like minor things that overall contributed to a larger difference or, you know, you can't really interpret this in any way. And people tried to argue that Gould lied about that or that he was wrong about this. Some of the arguments just don't even address things that Gould said. One paper from 2011 said, uh, you know, uh, Morton had shot had skulls that were measured with mustard seed and then later mm. changed to uh, like like uh, bird shot like BBs and um, Gould accepted that the BB measurements were super were valid like accurate they were well done this paper came and said we remeasured it the BB shots like those uh, measurements were accurate and so Gould is wrong when like Gould already right. accepted that so that made like no sense um, that's the classic. I think I just want to say that's the classic. And I mentioned that Nancy McLean thing. They try to get into an esoteric like bullshit and be like, see, and y y the point is like, you've, you've wasted so much of your life. You just accept the conclusion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, this is, this is like one, one section of one chapter. Mm -hmm. Um, there's another case where cool talks about the, the army beta test. So there was like an intelligence test that was used to screen infantrymen for world war one. And the beta test was one that was supposed to be for people who like couldn't speak English or were illiterate. Um, and like Gould administered this test to his Harvard students and talked about how the conditions for it were like totally, you could, you could never, no one could take a test of these conditions. Um, it was too crowded. People couldn't hear. There mm -hmm. are things in the test that people wouldn't reasonably be able to understand. Uh, one example in the book is uh, like a, a, a violin is shown missing strings and the, the test taker is supposed to draw in strings as like the missing thing, which like if you've never seen a violin before, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you're from like rural Appalachia or something, or you're, you're a first generation immigrant. You like, it's something you, you may have never seen. And a, a psychologist who, uh, unsurprisingly has some some uh, loose affiliations with the Pioneer Fund and is published in their journal Mankind Quarterly, uh, puts out this study uh, looking at the army, army beta test stuff and saying that Gould was wrong and then, but actually failed to like, failed to show that Gould was wrong. Like gave the test to his students at, at Utah Valley and they did even worse than Gould students at Harvard. Um, 
and a, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and then the last thing is like the G factor is thing a lot of people like cling on to. Gould goes into a lot of detail about the ways uh, that he he argues that the G factor is is sort of a statistical artifact that has been uh, given a concrete reality by the, these researchers. And this is sort of where I get out of my area of expertise when we're talking about like psychometrics and this like really like measurement statistical theory. My understanding at least is that there's quite a bit of open debate over whether the G factor is like a real biological thing or whether it's like the statistical aspect of tests. And there's, there's some researchers who have done like quite a bit of recent work comparing the two models, arguing that, you know, this, that G doesn't exist. It's, it's the fact that um, all, all things that are being measured by intelligence tests, they all sort of like um, reinforce each other through neurological development. And so you sort of get this positive correlation purely from all these independent things working together and like forming the brain and, and acting as you, as your brain develops. So um, at the very least, I think we can say that Gould wasn't debunked. Um, mm -hmm. right. You know, the arguments, the skepticism over the G factor is certainly like a lively discussion in the field. Um, and some of the other things, you know, the criticisms of, of um, Sam Morton, the criticisms of, you know, these various IQ tests and the way they were used at like Ellis Island or screaming, screening immigrants, you know, I mean, he's, he's like right on the point for so many of these things. It's definitely, um, you know, Gould was so effective and strong at criticizing this stuff that people have dedicated serious amount of time trying to like assassinate his character to undermine his mm. credibility, to, to debunk Gould. So that people don't listen, don't read this measure, things like that. One might say he's one of the most unfairly maligned men of uh, our generation. Um, uh, yeah, let, actually, let's talk about this because, like, I'm curious because you're in the radical scientist tradition. But my, like, that's not to say your conclusions are different than what a normal scientist would say about uh, heritability, right? Um, but there's this constellation of folks, and there have always been. You know, you had Charles Murray, then you had Sam Harris, um, and now and some other folks that like like to, you know. Uh, I don't know what the uh, uh, run interference uh, or at least launder a little bit of this stuff or give it the extreme benefit of the doubt and then also like retrieve re retreat quickly into their like normal message of I'm a martyr of uh, free speech um, and yeah, just talk about how like you think because um, it seems like the CRT like the CRT thing going on in schools it, this is just a different manifestation of it aimed at you know scientists yeah <clears throat> there's definitely um charles murray has done it a lot of a lot of the like really hardcore race science people have mm. have played this thing of like my research is being silenced like i'm being attacked by political ideologues um my stuff is being censored um i am sorry my cat jumped on my desk <laughs> <That's okay>. <laughs> <laughs> we're pro cat on the spot yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, absolutely can't stand out of getting attention, but, <laughs> um, yeah, I can, I don't know if I need to restart or, or just let me know. Oh, no, no, I think it's fine. No, go for it. Well, um, you know, um, the paint themselves as being persecuted, silent, censored, like exactly the same plays that like Jordan Peterson or, or Sam Harris mm -hmm. have played. And, most of the claims about it are like totally wrong. If anything, for like how awful the science is, these people have been published way more than they should have been. Um, you know, the 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 kind of will have uh, sympathetic people on editorial boards of journals, so there's always someone to like give their papers an extra nudge or put it to the right reviewer so it gets through. Uh, and like this is for like decades, there's always been one or two people letting this stuff slide. But it is this reflexiveness of the the really i think can't can't win on the scientific argumentation like there's some really killer arguments that have been made over the decades a lot of valid criticisms and so they take it instead and and they paint their opponents as ideologically motivated they paint mm -hmm. them as not wanting to entertain this debate which has been going on for 60 years <laughs> at this point and you know Anyone who reads through just a couple of articles should pick up on 
the same problems keep coming up over and over again. The same people keep trying to do the same shit at the same journals. And, um, you know, it's, it's, they don't change anything. And so I think that's where like you get these episodes with Sam Harris, who just like, after being criticized for all the like insane things he said about the middle East or like during the Iraq war, uh, and, like the new atheist phase just reflexively now, like anyone who gets criticized ever has to be a good person, just like Sam Harris is. And so he like jumps to the defense. And so like mm-hmm. he does that with Charles Murray, who, yeah. you know, is, is probably in my views, like one of just the most like odious political <laughs> commentators for like the last 30 years, at least. Yeah. I mean, no, Murray's uh, like an absolute, uh, <laughs> he's like, a, he's, 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 uh, He's the kind of villain like you wouldn't believe if he was in like a fiction, you know, he, like drama yeah, or something he's, like that. He's a cartoon. He has that book where he tries to like uh, objectively measure human accomplishment by looking <laughs> at encyclopedia entries. And he does the cutoff just right so that he can like ignore jazz music and then oh, argue no. that like black people have never contributed to like arts and culture because they Incredible. weren't they weren't like, you know, they didn't have the Baroque or the Renaissance period. You know, it really is just sort of like you, you, it would be too on the nose if you wrote Charles Murray into like cultural commentary. Yeah. He's, he's a type of figure that like sort of like this era of podcasting, like the Charles Murray era uh, episode of Chapo Trapos in the early episodes was like mind, mind just blew my mind because I, I knew the guy was familiar with that debate. Right. But then you actually go into his fucking biography and it's like, why the hell? This guy, like, just the cl- the clearly like mm-hmm. the reactionary plant is going to be driving just decades of discourse. It's it's disgusting. Well, on on the other side of this, though, I I, th- I highly suggest people um, read your review. The genetic lottery is a bust for both genetics and and policy because, I mean, um, you know, the argument that Hardin and you were laying it out earlier before we sort of got sidetracked talking about the twin studies, like the argument that you know she's making is that like you know we have to be able to engage with the science. Right. And she uses these three um, terms, right? There's like eugenic when it comes to using science and policy, there's eugenic policy, there's genome blind policy and anti um, eugenic um, approaches to policy. Uh, Could you talk about a a little bit about that and just sort of, um, you know, help people understand? Because I think we're people like Harris and and Hardin, I think, get like a lot of space with people to sort of um, make their arguments as people do have this kind of initial reaction, like, well, of course, we should let science influence our, our policy. Could you sort of talk about how that might be a little bit of a mistaken framing um, for how? Yeah. Framing? Yeah. The, the whole premise of the book, I think really gets, it doesn't fully escape the same sort of like biological determinist or like genetic exceptionalism problems that I think mm-hmm. the field kind of has. Like she tries to frame it in some cases as uh, we can use genetics to guide our studies about environmental interventions, um, which is like partially true. Like there's some cases where it can be a useful thing, but there's also this whole thing about treating fundamentally social phenomena as like a biological problem Mm. or something that should be understood or analyzed at the biological level. And there's cases where like this keeps cropping up. There's one section that like has just irked me ever since I read it, which is talking about how like, you know, genetics, genetic predispositions change the probability of someone ending up homeless, which is like just the most brain dead thing I can think of when you're talking about homelessness. Like it's purely a social Mm -hmm. problem. It doesn't matter if, if we frame it in terms of, oh, people can have uh, depression or mental health problems or addiction problems. And those are genetic and that like changes the probability of being homeless. Like, no, the problem of being homeless is like we make people need money to have shelter. Yeah. And like that's you can't get around anything There's more nothing natural than that. about that. There weren't homeless people before society, you know. Yeah. And and that kind of I want to I want to say naivete and that may be like a little bit little bit harsh, but like Harden is very much just like a center left liberal type person. And like the way mm. that that kind of like colors the way that she thinks about things I think shines through. Mm. So, you know, in the the eugenic genome blind anti eugenic, there's you know one case where we're talking about healthcare policy, and Hardin talks about like eugenics being like you know we'll you know we we don't want to take care of the weak or you know the sick people like aren't worthy of being in the gene pool or whatever. It's kind of like you know hardline eugenics. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And in the case of like genetic information, it's, well, we'll use genetic information so that we can exclude people with pre-existing conditions from like accessing healthcare, or we'll charge them more for healthcare because they cost us more money. And the genome blind is like, we don't use genetic information at all when we're like, uh, when we're getting people access to health insurance or healthcare. And the anti-eugenic is we use genetic information to like tailor healthcare to people based off of their genetic predispositions. Which, like, there's kind of just a, a, a long list of problems with that, which is, like, mostly we know that people have pre-existing conditions without genetic data. Like, you're going to the doctor, you have family history, you have diagnoses. Even if it's not genetic, like, I have a congenital heart defect, it was developmental, and there's no genetic screen to catch that, but it is biologically a health issue that I have. Mm -hmm. And the other side of it is, we don't need to means test healthcare with genetics. We can just have universal healthcare policies. And like the only mention that universal healthcare has in this book is one sentence that's like universal healthcare is too hard of a problem for us to pass right now. So instead we should use genetics to dole out people's proper amount of healthcare. And that it's a never ending list of things like that. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we could, radically change the way that our educational institutions work, the, how much it costs, the way they're funded, the cost of college, um, all these things that, you know, nudge people from different class backgrounds to go to college, to not go to college, what they major in. Um, we could totally change the way that uh, higher earning jobs require a, a bachelor's degree or a master's or, or, or doctorate now. And, you know, uh, when unions bargain for increased wages for like an entire labor sector there's not a genetic change there like it's just social environmental political conditions altering and i think hardin's entire book is framed of we just need to get more information use genetics so that we can find these technocratic mm. like incremental solutions to you know gloss over like fundamental failures of capitalism and it neglects like these larger political and social solutions. Uh, and that I think is, is I think where, where her book specifically goes wrong. Like she's not as, as, as evil as Charles Murray. She just doesn't, she's not approaching these problems from the right lens, I think. And even yeah. the possibility that they have to help just isn't the right way to help. It, it, it is interesting. Like the, the Medicare for all thing, you know, you mentioned like a, a center left liberal and I think that's a good assessment. Center left liberals really love JD Vance at first. Uh, I think <laughs> you should point out. Um, and it really does seem like a a you mentioned like the the homelessness thing. Like a, it's a substitution for anti capitalist and uh, anti racist mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of policy, basically. And and that that what also seemed like a tell is she she takes a swipe at Ibram Kendi, who I don't have I have criticisms of uh, mainly for his um, participation in like the capitalist commodification of things like anti racism. But her attack of him wasn't a fair one of uh, what he said. And he see he is a a regular target of a, of a certain kind of tendency um, that I, I think, I don't know, that that bit, it, it seemed a bit showing her ideology a little bit, like what the type of thing she's reading regularly. She, she wants to be like the reasonable person in the center. And so that's why decades of criticism from people on the left is just ideologically motivated. The people that use even her research to try to support, uh, you know, race science or, or um, you know these conclusions about racial differences um, or economic differences, uh, they're ideologically motivated. She's the reasonable, objective one in the center, trying to mm -hmm. talk sense into all the crazy people on both sides. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just you know it's very uh, ideologically constrained. Um, there's a great quote from another Richard Lewinton book where he's talking about um, tuberculosis. And uh, people talk about the cause of tuberculosis and like tuberculosis epidemics uh, in like the 20th century as you know being caused by the bacteria that you know leads to, to tuberculosis. But they don't talk about like the awful sanitation and public health conditions that led mm -hmm. to the spread of tuberculosis. And so when you like identify things as a biological problem, that it's the bacteria that causes tuberculosis, you ignore it's you know the um, 
unconstrained like destructive nature of capitalist systems and and like the poor conditions that people live in that also are a very strong cause of like tuberculosis outbreaks Mm -hmm. and people like status quo people or people that want to support like current institutions and ideologies like don't want to entertain those like major political social upheavals or those changes at that level. And that's what her book is for. It's like exactly for people. She's profiled in New Yorker and the New Yorker. And this, this book is like perfect for New Yorker readers. (laughs) Princeton University press too. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking about like in the, like in the U S like the early, the late 19th century, you had all these people being sort of forced, small farmers being forced off of their, you know, their farms because of like capitalist accumulation. And then they're sort of forced in, you know, they're proletarianized, they're living in bad conditions. And you see this drop in eight life expectancy for Americans. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I'm just laughing at the idea of sitting there and be like, oh, there's something genetic um, going on here <laughs> instead of the, the fact that, yeah, these people were like violently dispossessed and, you know, sort of pushed into conditions uh, that were much worse than the ones they were brought up under. We just got to find a better medicine. We give them medicine. <laughs> like, don't don't worry about like the standing water, or, like or like you know, sewage sitting in the in the street. Like, it's just we just like give more money to the to you know a company to to make a, a pill or something. Yeah. Uh, so, Kevin, uh, people should follow you at the Bird Maniac on Twitter. Uh, I, give us. Uh, you've mentioned a couple uh, books. Uh, well, I mentioned the Mismeasure of Man by Gould uh, and the Luantin book. Was it not in our genes? Yeah. Um, anything else that uh, people uh, want to sort of delve into this radical scientist uh, sort of uh, tradition? What any recommendations you have there? Yeah. So um, there's a couple other Richard Lewinton books. I'm a, a fairly big acolyte at this point. But so there's Bio- Biology is Ideology, which is a short collection of essays or a YouTube lecture series. And there's The Dialectical Biologist, which is a collection of essays that really explores kind of this broader uh, approach of applying... Um, principles of like dialectical thinking and dialectical materialism into the practice of science between Richard Lewinton and Richard Levins, who were uh, two kind of radical scientist members. And then um, the that, that movement had a magazine called Science for the People, and it published a lot of stuff and a lot of these thinkers through, um, through the 70s. And it's back now. It started republishing in like 2015, I think. And so like people should totally check out uh, Science for the People, um, subscribe if they want. There's there's print editions being mailed. Um, you know, I I subscribe. I don't really have any other strong affiliation with them, but I just really like all the work that they do. Very nice. Well, Kevin Bird, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is a great discussion, and uh, we've got to have you back. Some, I'm you know, hopefully maybe about something besides um, race, <laughs> IQ science, <laughs> um, something more I guess enchanting uh, scientifically. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, this is a great conversation. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks again for having me.